podcast with me Carly. Hope you are all well witches. Our episode today is a look at Primrose Hill, our cottage witches yule preparations with a look at the pine tree, gingerbread and ginger and their many magical associations and lore. This episode has been inspired firstly by a film I watched recently called Gretel and Hansel, a dark look at the original Brothers Grimm story. It's witchy as hell, has a very dark aesthetic. If you like films like The Witch, The Green Knight, two of my faves, these had similar feels to it in respect of filming for me. The only criticism I have is the accents of the actors in the film, which threw me because the witch has an Irish accent, fair. Other characters are British, but the two kids are American, which threw me out based on the time it is set in. How all these accents managed to join together in this one location, which let's face it would probably be the Black Forest or somewhere in Germany, if it is based on the original story. I digress, I'm being pernickety, but this film, along with an amazing book I'm currently reading, I will bring it to the podcast. The story is about Hansel and Gretel after their witch experience. These two combined had me inspired by the deep dark forest, witches' houses and gingerbread. To kick things off today, we have our book review and our book is the Lost Lands, A Magical History of Lemuria, Atlantis and Avalon by Lucy Cavendish. I bought this book prior to going to Glastonbury as I wanted to learn all about Avalon and this book did not disappoint. For a chunky book, I ploughed through this pretty quickly. It was fascinating. The book starts out with a quiz of sorts to understand which lost land of the three you are most likely more associated with. My answer came out as Lemurian and after reading the section on Lemuria, I had so many downloads and synchronicities and things that came up for me. I found the timeline in the book of the pre-ancient world fascinating. Actually made a lot of sense in regards to the very limited information I already possess relating to the Great Floods, but also what I mentioned on the Druid episode about the romantic idea that many of the tribes across the globe were those individuals who were perhaps originally from Atlantis. Much of this book is based on collections of individuals' past life memories in respect of Lemuria and Atlantis, pieced together with dialogues on Atlantis from Plato and so on. All I can say is this book blew my mind. It delves into how each land was said to look, where they were said to be, the energy that remains still in that region, how society was, relationships they held with various other galactic beings, crystals they worked with and how they were used in their day-to-day life, how the Lemurians and Atlanteans looked, how their bodies worked. Also a look at animals and elementals that shared each region with them and how we can connect with each lost land today. The Avalon section was interesting. It delved into Glastonbury, Avebury, Stonehenge, a lot of the West Country areas that I'm really familiar with that are associated with Avalon, along with other parts of the globe that are said to be linked to Avalon. In this section, it looked at the Avalonian pantheon with Merlin, Ariane Rod, Lady of the Lake, 
Bridget, the Morrigan, Morgan Le Fay, Guinevere, many other Celtic deities also. This section has some wonderful meditations, spell work, symbols of Avalon, so delves into the spiral, Triskali and so on, what their meanings are. And I particularly loved the crop circle section and what it could all relate to. This book is out there, so you have to be prepared for that. And I always love a book like this. I definitely wouldn't say it is for the most logical or sceptic witch. I do find it amazing how many people have past life memories or dreams of these lost lands and the collections of stories all compared against one another all seem to show similarities. If anything, this book inspired awe in me. It made me feel very tiny in a huge universe and space of time, which is always good and makes me stop stressing about whatever tiny rubbish I'm usually overthinking. On top of that, this book is so beautiful. It has gorgeous mermaids that adorn the cover and the book includes stunning maps of where each land is said to be. This book will truly take you away upon reading. And who knows, perhaps you will surface some of your own memories of Lemuria, Atlantis or Avalon. Join me after the break to meet Primrose Hill and her preparations for you. The kitchen cottage was toasty and warm, fueled by the high heat emanating from the flames of the huge oven. The witch was stooped over, casting her eye over the many small men she had baking in there. This witch is Primrose Hill. The men are tiny ones formed of ginger, flour, sugar, golden syrup, butter, along with a dash of cinnamon. Fortunately, there are no small children present to push this witch into said oven. We can rest assured they likely would have no desire to, based on Primrose's kindly demeanour. Once Primrose was certain the small army of gingerbread men were fully baked, she retrieved them from the oven using her oven gloves, wincing at how hot they were before dropping the baking tray with a clatter onto the wooden kitchen countertop. She stood, hands on hips, admiring her handiwork, contemplating how beautifully she would embellish these little chaps with icing. They already had raisin eyes and red and green sweets for buttons where their little jackets would be worn. Yule always conjured up Primrose's memories of her grandmother telling her the story of Hansel and Gretel and the witch's house in the forest. Her grandmother always keen to explain to a younger Primrose that perhaps the witch should have been considered more of a crotchety, cannibalistic psychopath than a witch, for she bore little resemblance to the hill women and their lives as solitary witches in the woods. The Hexen House, as her grandmother referred to it as, or witch's house in English, was Primrose's favourite part of the story. Whilst they mixed, rolled out the gingerbread dough and prepared it to be baked, her grandmother would explain how former hill witch women would bake large batches of gingerbread and sell it at the local winter fairs. Coming back to present day, Primrose had festive music playing softly in the backgrounds on her old record player. She glanced out the window at the low rising sun and the snow whirling and settling upon the ground of her small garden. She spotted the red bushy tail of a fox as it darted into the boundary of the forest, its fiery colour stark against the bone-white snow. 
Yule was a couple of days ahead and today seemed the best day following the recent heavy snow to set out to the woods to seek out some fallen pine boughs, cones and other adornments she could collect from the forest floor to use as Yule decorations. So far she had been fortunate enough to have been given some mistletoe by her neighbour who had a huge bounty of it growing upon the oak trees surrounding their farm. Primrose had hung it from the wooden eaves and above doorways throughout her cottage. She wasn't entirely convinced anyone would be visiting the cottage that Yule who would benefit from a kiss underneath it. Instead, Primrose was drawing on the mistletoe's other powerful aspects of good luck and protection. Primrose's grandmother's grimoire was already out on the kitchen table, for she had used the recipe within for gingerbread. In keeping with her intentions for Yule, as the gingerbread men called and Primrose prepared to venture out into the cold, seeking pine trees, she thought she would take this moment in time to study the Hill Witch's ancient knowledge recorded on both. Gingerbread. Gingerbread has its origins in ancient Greece and Egypt. It was introduced to Europe during the 11th century when trading along the spice routes from the Middle East developed. Ancient Roman men were said to eat anatomically correct cakes before orgies in order to stimulate their sexual desires. Man-shaped cakes were created as sacrificial offerings in Roman Saturnalia celebrations. They also prepared extravagant spiced versions of gingerbread that was generally baked in a heart shape and served at weddings. They were considered status symbols for the use of the spices was so lavish and signified prestige and affluence amongst wealthy Romans. When the Roman Empire dissolved, so did traces of gingerbread. During the 13th century, Marco Polo brought ginger to the west from China and in the following centuries it spread across Europe starting out as a rare, expensive spice until gradually it became cheaper and more widely available. Historically, aromatic crumbled gingerbread would often be added to recipes to mask the odour of decaying meat before the ability to refrigerate or preserve food. Gingerbread and bread have no connection. Gingerbread comes from Ginger's original Latin name, Zimba, which in turn was derived from an older Sanskrit word for horn-shaped or antler-shaped, referring to Ginger's multi-branched rhythm. Zimba eventually became gingembre in Old French. At first, this simply meant preserved ginger, but then came to mean any food prepared with ginger. When the word gingembre travelled to Chaucer's medieval England, it was corrupted to gingebreed, which finally became the gingerbread that persists today. So convoluted though it may be, there is a sound rationale for calling gingerbread gingerbread, even though it isn't bread. Even more remarkable than not being bread, Gingerbread doesn't even have to have ginger. Artists and artisans associated with gingerbread baking had their own guilds as well. These included the beekeepers who provided the necessary honey, the master carvers of the gingerbread moulds, the gold beaters who hammered gold into delicate leaf, and the goldsmiths who applied the precious gold to the intricately imprinted gingerbread. In England, gingerbread was traditionally coloured with powdered sandalwood, known as red sanders. This created such a demand for pulverised sandalwood that there was actually a guild of sanders beaters whose job it was to grind this very hard brick red wood into a fine dust. 
the guild members could craft gingerbread all year round. However, the home baker was only allowed to make it upon Christmas and Easter. As spices became less expensive, common people began to buy and eat gingerbread as a treat on special occasions. Gingerbread became such a staple at medieval fairs in England, France, Holland and Germany that the festivals came to be known as gingerbread fairs and the gingerbreads served there as fairings. Some gingerbread fairs persisted for centuries. For example, a gingerbread fair was held at one Parisian abbey from the 11th to the 19th century. The monks at this abbey sold gingerbread in the shape of pigs. Monks were known to feed the hungry with gingerbread and to use it to educate the villagers about religion. They would often craft the gingerbread into biblical scenes or of saints. For those on pilgrimage, they would often be sustained by gingerbread they brought on the route. Some would even return with souvenir gingerbread in the image of the holy site they had visited. Children learned the alphabet from a gingerbread slab with letters inscribed on it. This was a cheaper version of the horn book, a handheld wooden paddle with paper with lessons pasted onto it. Once children learned a letter from a gingerbread horn book, they were allowed to eat it. English poet and diplomat Matthew Pryor celebrates this method in this verse. A horn book gives of gingerbread and that the child may learn the better as he can name he eats the letter. Proceeding thus with vast delight, he spells and gnaws from left to right. The historical trends in gingerbread shapes and its imprinted images offer a unique window through which to understand daily life and culture throughout the centuries. As daily life changed with the seasons, so did the designs on gingerbread. Flowers during the springtime Easter fairs, animals and birds in the fall. If a fair honoured a town's patron saint, that saint's image might be stamped on the gingerbread along with other religious symbols. Christmas motifs included the nativity. Some culinary historians believe that other images such as stars, the sun and the moon are vestiges of forgotten pagan celebrations. Women frequently gifted favoured knights with gingerbread talismans for good luck in tournaments or battle. These chivalric motifs included images of riders on horseback, castles, trumpets and swords. Gingerbread hearts tied with ribbons were especially popular and when exchanged became tokens of love. For the lustier lovers, a selection of gingerbread sporting bawdy and ribald images were also available. In these superstitious times, belief in magic was widespread in all classes of society. Supernatural powers were ascribed to many things, including gingerbread. Specific designs were believed to bring about specific desired effects. Consuming the correct type of pitcher cookie was thought to enhance romance, fertility and sexual prowess. For example, gingerbread in the shape of men were called husbands and if eaten by maidens were thought to attract a real life husband before long. Eating a dog-shaped gingerbread ensured fidelity. A pig for luck, a hare for fertility, a swaddled baby for a child, and a lion man, a mythical lion-headed human creature for virility. Eating a heart-shaped gingerbread would naturally guarantee love, but would also ward off evil and eating letters of the alphabet would dispel ignorance. According to a Swedish tradition, you can even make a wish with gingerbread. First, put the gingerbread in the palm of your hand and make a wish. Next, 
Break the gingerbread with the index finger or thumb of your other hand. If the gingerbread breaks into three parts, your wish will come true. Queen Elizabeth's fondness for gingerbread was legendary and she even employed her own gingerbread baker. The unique conjunction of Queen Elizabeth's sweet tooth, her uncanny political instincts and her master baker's technical skill resulted in absolutely splendid gingerbread men which were employed in high level political gamesmanship. To flatter one of her most ardent admirers, the Earl of Leicester, Robert Dudley, she instructed her baker and confectioners to make gingerbread in his likeness. Dudley was known for his sartorial excellence and the most minute details of his elaborate costumes were captured in these incredible ginger cookies. Playing upon the jealousy of her other courtiers, she then gave or withheld personalised gingerbread to confer status or withdraw favour in her inner circle. Receiving one's own likeness in gingerbread from Queen Elizabeth signified a royal stamp of approval for both visiting dignitaries and the revolving group of handsome admirers vying for her attention. On the other hand, one can only imagine how an out-of-favour courtier might have felt watching Queen Elizabeth bite off the head of his own gingerbread likeness. Queen Elizabeth's weakness for sweets eventually caused her teeth to turn black with decay. The ladies of her court, no less politically astute, quietly blackened their own teeth to match their queen. Soon, black teeth became an enviable sign of aristocratic status, as only the wealthy could afford sugar. Their blackened teeth identified them as members of the elite. While still immensely popular in Elizabethan times, a sinister thread in gingerbread's history also began to emerge. Superstition and deeply held belief in magic and witchcraft dominated life in the royal courts, as well as in the villages and countryside of 16th century Europe. Gingerbread, particularly in the shape of a man, was believed to possess dangerous magical powers. Witches were generally believed to bake gingerbread effigies of their enemies and by eating them cause death and destruction. In 1603, King James I came from Scotland to the English throne, deeply superstitious and convinced that Scottish witches were plotting against him. He enacted a harsh witch law in an attempt to protect himself from their spells. A fear that gingerbread men could be the agents of the devil also spread throughout Europe. Ironically, the story of Hansel and Gretel by the Brothers Grimm brought gingerbread back into favour. This is, of course, where we see Gretel and her younger brother Hansel sent out into the woods until they stumble upon a house made of all manner of sweet, edible goodies. An alternative name for the gingerbread house in Germany is Hexenhaus, meaning witch's house. First editions of Hansel and Gretel's tale see the house as a little house that was made entirely of bread and covered with cake and the windows were made of light coloured sugar. Retellings of the story see the gingerbread house arrive in full force, often decorated with sweets, chocolate and the like, which was a reflection of how gingerbread houses were seen at Yule. The gingerbread house in Hansel and Gretel is an integral part of the story. Lebkuchen is a spiced cake containing ginger originating from Germany centuries back, traditionally baked during winter months. Making gingerbread houses became a Christmas Yule tradition. They were often elaborately decorated. This is from William Shakespeare loves labours lost and I had but one penny in the world 
thou shouldest have it to buy gingerbread. Ginger, its element is fire. It has a masculine energy linked to the planet Mars and zodiac signs, Aries, Sagittarius and Scorpio. Its magical themes are courage, energy, healing, inspiration, love, lust, money, passion, power, success, relationships, sex, luck, romance, fighting nightmares, accelerating spellcraft, rejuvenation, vitality, stamina, protection, activating higher consciousness, awakening intuition, grounding, stability, clarity, releasing anger or frustration, releasing resentment and jealousy, brings balance and contentment. Like cinnamon, ginger is considered a magical catalyst that adds extra power to any spell. It also speeds things up. The energies of fire and passion are said to be compacted in the root, helping to bring plans to fruition more quickly. Place a piece of ginger on your altar to enhance all your magical endeavours. Ginger is believed to conjure the energies of both Mars and the Sun to invoke strength. Ginger is considered a powerful aphrodisiac used since antiquity in spells and potions relating to love, sex and fertility. Ginger is even mentioned in the Karma Sutra as a means to enhance sexual relations. To attract love, you could dress a candle with ginger powder before a love ritual. It can also be added to love oils or potions you create. Add other aphrodisiacs such as cinnamon to increase passion in a relationship. Add ginger to an attraction spell bag in order to bring in passion and to bring heat into a relationship. Use in kitchen witchery for spicing up your relationship. It can be added to romantic meals, perhaps for anniversaries, Valentine's Day or hand fasting. Ginger has been viewed as a symbol of love throughout many cultures and subsequently used in love spells and rituals to attract passion and romantic relationships. Ginger is said to attract prosperity and help with issues around poverty. Keeping a ginger root or plant in or around your home is said to attract money. Sprinkle powdered ginger on your wallet or into your pocket to attract more money. Burning ginger root at home can help to attract success. Smoke from the ignited root is said to help in dissolving spells cast against you. Burning ginger helps overall to energise your space whilst removing harmful energies. It has been valued for centuries as an energising spice that is believed to awaken the senses, invigorate the body and stimulate circulation. Boil nutmeg, cinnamon and ginger in your cauldron as a warming aroma within your home. Ideal for the autumn and winter sabbats. You may wish to place real ginger ale in your chalice to keep upon your altar or to use in celebration with your coven or family at Samhain or Yule. A means of sharing warmth between you in keeping with the season. Chewing, eating or drinking ginger is said to help fight fatigue and provide you with increased energy. It's ideal to consume in some manner before spell or ritual work to increase your mental energy. You can create a ginger infusion to be used when you need to banish something. Boil a piece of ginger root in water for around 10 to 20 minutes once cooled, bottle and sprinkle where required. Should you require a dose of courage or confidence, chew on ginger root for it is said to stir courage within. Ginger has strong protective energy. Add to amulets as a powerful protection talisman. 
It works a charm against evil spirits, negative energies and misfortune throughout various folk traditions. Ginger has also been used as a talisman for good luck, prosperity and fortune. When ginger root takes the form of a human, it is said to hold increased powerful energy. Ginger can be placed under your child's bed or sewn into a toy they favour to prevent nightmares. It is said to bring them a sense of safety and protection at bedtime. Ginger has the ability to be added to any spell. You can add to spell jars or moon water when required. To amplify fire magic, place ginger near candles whilst working candle magic. Drinking ginger tea can help you prior to meditating or should your energy feel scattered. It can help to keep you grounded and bring in an energy of stability. Eat ginger root before casting spells to lend more power to your spell. Draw upon the heat within this root. It can help increase your bodily energy and magical powers overall. Combine ginger with mugwort, dill, mint, rosemary, yarrow and marjoram and burn as a combination. This increases the potency of the ginger and acts as an aid during meditation. Ginger is ideal to add to spells linked to improving an individual's health. It has been used as a digestive aid as far back as the Middle Ages. Ginger is believed to strengthen the immune system and helps the body fight off infections. It's anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, lowers the risk of infection, reduces cholesterol and triglyceride levels in the bloodstream. It can help prevent blood clots and improve brain function. It can help fight off flu, the common cold and nausea. It can also act as a remedy to relieve motion sickness and pregnancy nausea. Ginger can help break up and expel digestive gas, increase gastric mobility and the speed in which the stomach is emptied. Ginger tea is a remedy for nausea, indigestion, diarrhea and gas. It can fight off bacteria that causes gastritis, ulcers and reflux. Negative side effects of ginger can be hives, itching, heartburn, diarrhea and stomach pain. Gingerbread poppets. Human-shaped biscuits can be traced as far back in history as 217 BCE to the Saturnalia celebrations in Rome, where they were used as sacrifices to the agricultural god Saturn. This tradition was used within many other cultures, often as offerings to their own agricultural deities. This Yuletide, you may wish to create some gingerbread men as a different take on the more traditional poppet used in spell work. They are ideal to bake and use in spells, removing the energy of someone who has mistreated or wronged you. Alternatively, you may wish to create these for the new year in order to remove any negative energy or conflict with anyone from your life before you step into the next year. Find and follow your chosen gingerbread man recipe and while mixing and baking, focus your intent on removing the power a specific negative person may hold over you. Ginger can speed things up and add an extra kick of power to this recipe. You may wish to add cinnamon for its healing and peace qualities. Prior to placing the gingerbread men in the oven, you may wish to draw protection sigils on the gingerbread men to protect you from the individual the poppet is aimed at, the person you wish to remove from your life. Once the gingerbread men are baked, before eating, envisage the person you have based this poppet on. Consider the power they held over you 
and now your power over this representation of them. Visualize the power of their words and influence over you, dissipating as you eat the biscuit and feel yourself back in control. You may wish to eat these in a solitary moment or share within ceremony with friends. Pine. Old Pine by Ben Howard. We stood, steady as the stars in the woods, so happy hearted, and the warmth rang true inside these bones. As the old pine fell, we sang, just to bless the morning. Pine is linked to the element of air and fire. It has a masculine energy. It is linked to the planet Mars and zodiac signs, Aries and Scorpio. Linked to the deities Merlin, Druantia, Pan, Attis, Dionysus, Diana, Bacchus, Rhea, Sibylle and Eragon. Linked to the crystal moonstone. Its magical properties are immortality, healing, fertility, cleansing, wealth, purification and exorcism. Its Latin name is Pinus and folk names windmill palm and bloom. The pine tree symbolises peace, miracles and longevity as it can remain green all year round. A shining example of a tree that reaches for the stars, reminding us to work towards our dreams. When the pine tree shows up for us, it asks us to consider our own individuality a reminder to be authentically ourselves, and this in turn will contribute to our life and others. If your dreams are different to those around you, this is something to be celebrated. Consider what you have always desired to do with your life. You may wish to daydream, contemplating this and allow it to lead you to your next life adventure. In ancient times, the pine was considered holy and therefore forbidden to be cut down. Some Christians considered the pine tree as malefic as it was associated with the deities Pan, Dionysus and Attis. In Greek myth, Pan relentlessly pursued a nymph by the name of Pities. The gods turned her into a pine tree to help her escape. The story of Attis, god of vegetation, his repeated cycle of consuming himself, dying and resurrecting represents the agricultural cycle. The demon Agdistis is linked to both the birth and death of Attis. Agdistis had both female and male reproductive organs. The gods feared this and plotted his death. Tricked into swallowing a sleeping potion, the gods tied his male genitalia to his foot. He castrated himself when he woke and stood. His blood fell to earth, fertilising the ground. An almond tree grew where it fell and Nana, the daughter of the river god Sangarius, picked almonds from the tree and carried them at her bosom. The almonds disappeared and Nana became pregnant with Attis. So strangely, Attis was said to be born on December 25th to his mother, Nana, who of course was a virgin as she became pregnant by the almonds. Nana abandoned her baby and a he-goat found him and cared for him until eventually a couple became his foster parents. Attis grew into a handsome man with long hair and godlike features. He got engaged to the daughter of King Midas of Pessinos. However, Agdistis, in the guise of the earth mother goddess Sibylle, fell in love with him on sight. During Attis's wedding, as the vocalist performed the wedding song, a jealous Agdistis, Sibylle, attacked driving the bridegroom and the father of the bride mad. Attis and his father-in-law castrated themselves in front of the wedding guests and the bride cut off her own breasts. Attis died as a result of his self-inflicted wounds. 
The heartbroken Agdistis begged Zeus, the father god, to preserve Attis so his body would never decay or decompose. Although immortal, Attis was venerated and worshipped. Originally a part of the pantheon of Phrygia, the Greeks added him to their pantheon, also elevating him to an agriculture god. A statue of him stands at the shrine of Attis on the campus of the Magna Mater in Ostia Antica, Italy. Another statue, which was at the mouth of Rome's river, now resides in the Vatican Museum. It depicts Attis reclining post-castration, holding a shepherd's crook in his left hand and a pomegranate in his right. He wears a pine garland with fruits interwoven and a Phrygian cap featuring a crescent moon. Attis and priests were eunuchs, following the, in the footsteps of their god. Artifacts found in Herculaneum, such as a wood throne that featured a relief of Attis beneath a sacred pine gathering pine cones, indicate the Attis cult was popular in 79 AD when Mount Vesuvius erupted. According to another Greek myth, the resin tears of the pine tree are the blood of Attis. He was said to run to the mountains and castrated himself by a tree, resulting in him bleeding to death. Jupiter took pity on him and turned him instead into the immortal pine tree. Following that, Saturn was said to become his protector and one of Saturn's prominent signs is the pine. A cheerful little tale, wouldn't you agree? For the Romans, the pine was an object of worship during the spring equinox festival of Sibylle and Attis. The ancient Egyptians buried an image of the god Osiris in the hollowed out centre of a pine tree. Pine was also a fertility symbol linked to the Dionysus Bacchus mythology surrounding the vine and winemaking. Worshippers of Dionysus carried a phallic pine cone tipped wand. Pine cone images appear on a number of ancient fertility amulets. The Celts used pine to form protection circles when performing their magic out in nature, mainly for rituals relating to love and conception. Despite being considered of a masculine energy, the Celts believed the pine to be representative of the woman in her fruitful phase and of holding a mother energy. Pine cones have long been symbolic of the pine tree's womb and make powerful fertility charms. Druids used to light large bonfires of Scots pine at the winter solstice. This was to celebrate the passing of the seasons and to draw back the sun. Glades of Scots pine were also decorated with lights and shiny objects. The tree covered in stars was a representation of the divine light. It is easy to see how these rituals have given rise to the latter day Yule log and Christmas tree custom. But let's hear a little story about how it fits into the church's narrative. The pine appears in legends relating to Saint Boniface, an English Benedictine monk who in some tales brought down a giant ash tree representing Yggdrasil, an immense and sacred tree within Norse cosmology connecting the nine worlds. In its place, he planted a pine tree, decorating it with candles to represent God's purification and light. Pine trees have long been used as Christmas and funerary trees, symbolic of spiritual consciousness, everlasting eternal life and enlightenment. To meditate under a pine tree is said to present one with a fresh perspective on a situation and provide a renewed sense of purpose. The pine also represents strength and adversity and can support us in boosting our physical energy and mental processes. Pine oil scent can help us to feel vigour, 
alert and hopeful when we are lacking motivation in our life. Pine cones have often been carried by a person to draw upon their energy for strength and health in old age. The Romans would often eat pine nuts to increase vigour and strength. Pine holds an ancient spirit. Along with the conifer, it is one of the oldest plants that flourished following the glacial period prior to broad-leaved trees. The only tree in Northern Europe to survive the Ice Age is Scots pine. It is said that clumps of pine mark out ley lines. Some Highlanders used split pine roots as tapers to light their homes. Pine candles were also part of wedding rituals in Scottish fishing communities. The belief was they brought prosperity and luck to the newlyweds. In a lot of Scottish folk craft, especially in the Orkney area, people would circle a pine candle three times around a mother and her newborn child to purify them. Near Aberfoyle, there is a Scots pine known as the fairy tree. Legend has it that the Reverend Robert Kirk was abducted by fairies in 1692. His spirit is said to remain within this ancient tree. A persistent theme in the folklore of Scots pine is their use as markers in the landscape. In the Highlands, they marked the burial places of warriors, heroes and chieftains. Further south, Scots pine were more unusual and would have stood out. Because of this, people used them to mark ancient trackways and crossroads. In England, they often marked drove roads and the perimeters of meadows on which drovers and their herds could spend the night. There is also the more fanciful suggestion that Jacobite sympathisers planted Scots pine in England. Scots pine is the badge of several clans. Wearing tartan was outlawed after the unsuccessful Jacobite rebellion in 1745. The clan MacGregor wore the Scots pine as their plant badge in a gesture of defiance. Scots pine was a symbol of durability, as in the Gaelic proverb, hard as the heather, lasting as the pine. The pine spirit is said to be somewhat melancholy, solitary, but also healing and negativity banishing. Its spirit honours the cycles of living despite its evergreen status. Some ways you could use pine in your craft are use pine to smoke cleanse or burn in the hearth to protect and warm the home. Hang a pine branch across the doorway of your home to retain luck and joy. Hang one above your bed to ward against illness during the cold winter months. Use pine within your rituals to attract prosperity and to assist you in staying the course amidst trying times. Meditate with pine to overcome dark moods. Pine upon your altar wards off negative energies and evil influences. Burning pine needles can reverse and send back spells. Burning pine wood chips will drive spirits away from your home. Use pine within rituals to invoke nature and wood spirits. Pine cones are a source of food to many small mammals and birds, and it forms as a source of timber and resin for us humans. Resin is often used to purify, sterilize and embalm items that need to be preserved over time, aligning with its immortality symbolism. Resin was used in censers in temples to evoke the eternal. Mix pine resin with sage, mint or lemon to purify yourself prior to ritual. Pine resin and needles mixed together forms a great ward for evil and low-level spirits. Pine has long been used throughout the course of time in malefic magic rituals to infuse pain and injury. Pine has many healing qualities too. It's antiseptic, expectorant and anti-inflammatory. Infuse pine needles to make an inhalant to reduce congestion. 
Pine needle tea can aid healing bladder issues, urinary tracts and kidney problems. Pine needles and cones are rich in vitamin A and C. You can add them to your bath to aid with respiratory complaints, skin conditions and rheumatic pain. Sunshine and happiness destined to fill your days may begin with a celebration, the evergreen pine, always decorated at this time of year, anticipates spring, news or a meeting that will be as equally bright as the Yule Log's pure white flame that represents eternal life. A new start is imminent and misunderstandings are resolved signified by the purifying sap of the tree, which smells of fresh new life. You may expect permanence in love as the evergreen needles appear in pairs. Even in old age, the tree is green and vital, indicating long life and undiminished marriage bliss. Strength is on your side, represented by pine cones. That's by Gillian Kemp from Tree Magic. That is all I have for you today, witches. I will, of course, link in the show notes different articles and so on I've referenced for this episode. There was a particularly wonderful one for gingerbread, but I'll make sure that's all there for you to check out. If you would like some more witchy content, you may wish to join up to my Patreon, The Witches Institute. For just £6 a month, you get access to tons of podcasts, meditations, story retellings, hedge witch studies, a ton of witchy stuff. So I just want to say have an amazing Yule. I hope you have a wonderful time. I'll be back soon. I'll be back next week. I've got a few different authors coming onto the show to talk about different witchy topics. Really excited to get into that. But for now, have a great week, witches. I'm sending you lots and lots of witchy love.